Welcome everybody to the performance anxiety. 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 <laughs> Where we drink tea and spill the tea and do all that kind of fun stuff. Um, I am your host, Lisa Anderson, along with my co-host Joan Elizabeth. And today I am so excited because you have heard me reference him in past episodes, but I am here to introduce Mike Ritchie who was the person who taught me how to stage manage. And he has been a director for many a moon, and he's going to tell us all about that tonight. So welcome, Mike. Hi, glad to be here. This is awesome. (laughs) So, Mike, just start us off nice and simple. Um, Tell us about, like, how, kind of your little bit about your background um, in directing and theater. The quick story is that I, I got my start in New York. I'm from New York City. Um, and I was sort of mistakenly put into a show. My, my English teacher <laughs> had someone drop out from a show that he was doing and he was looking around and he said, Mike, you want to be in a play? And I had no idea what that entailed or what it meant. Uh, I said, I don't know. What do I have to do? He goes, well, it's a small part. It was a play called The Time of Your Life by William Saroyan. Uh, It's not much done now, but it was back then. And he said, then he's an Arab and he plays a harmonica. I I can't do either of those things. (laughs) And he goes, no problem. He goes, we could put a little makeup on you. Do you play any musical instrument? And I said, yeah, I play the accordion. He goes, fine, bring it in. So, <laughs> so I brought my accordion on stage and there was a piano player who was also in the play and we had to play a duet together. So I learned the music and we played. And when I wasn't playing, I just took the accordion off and set it down by my stool and uh, it was set in a bar. And so I had to speak in some kind of accent. I have no idea where it came from. <laughs> I, I, they, I, I'm, I'm sure any any people of Arab descent would just cringe at what I was doing <laughs> uh, for a 17 year old kid. I guess it was okay. Anyway, that was my first my first taste of theater, and it was sort of cool. I, I met a, a lot of great people, and I was sort of a loner in high school, so that opened up a whole different world for me. And uh, at the time, I was thinking of going into pre med. I was talking, I was taking a lot of AP courses. I took all AP science courses and I was pretty decent at it. So when I went to, I went to a community college and I started taking uh, all, all the science courses. And for an elective, I took an acting class. And my acting teacher said, wow, you really got something here. You should pursue this. And I said, well, you know, this is a whole lot more fun than my science classes. <laughs> I can't imagine yeah. why. <laughs> and so I started taking more acting classes. And then the dance teacher came into the acting class and said, hey, I need some guys for the dance class because no guys are signing up. Who's game? So I raised my hand. So she put me into the dance class. It was me, one other guy, and 25 really pretty girls. So I said, well, geez, this is like a no-brainer. <laughs> no complaints here, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I got started me on a certain path. When I went to uh, my four-year school, I, I decided to major in theater and fell in with a group of really cool people that uh, the professors gave us the keys to the black box theater. And we basically lived in there. We wrote plays, directed, designed, built. We did everything. And wow. so we we became sort of this theater company and um, it gave us a great experience of how to do everything. Um, yeah. And so when I went when I graduated, went back to New York City, I had to make money. I had to figure out how am I going to live in the city? So I got a rent free apartment. Um, and there are those things. Th- those exist. Um, wow. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> uh, yeah. There was an agency in New York that specialized in rent free apartments. And basically, it was somebody who had a very large apartment who needed a particular kind of service done, Uh, walking the dog, uh, cooking dinner, being a nanny. Anyway, I wound up going with a fellow who was a a novelist, but he had polio. 
So he needed somebody to go shopping for him and and uh, help organize his writing. So for one day a week, I worked for him. And then I had my own bedroom, use of the kitchen, my own bathroom, and my own private entrance. And wow. I didn't pay any rent. And this was in this is in a really nice section of news, Upper West Side, right by Central Park West. It was beautiful. So I had my own, I started a carpentry business. And I could, because I'm really good building stuff. So all of my clients were at Lincoln Center. So I worked totally on the buildings, all the apartment buildings around Lincoln Center. So my clients were uh, opera singers, musicians, dancers, actors that were working on Broadway. All those are my clients. And um, I, I, I got to be really good friends with some of them. One who was an opera singer, who was Bette Midler's voice teacher. I became good friends hey. with them. Uh, David Ogden Steers, who played Major Winchester on MASH. He was the voice of Cogsworth and Beauty and the Beast. We were good friends. Um, and so a lot of those kinds of connections that were made through my carpentry work. Uh, and I was taking acting classes the whole time and auditioning. Uh, in my auditioning work, I realized that I wasn't good enough to really get the roles that I felt I was going out for. And I said, holy cow, you know, these people are great and I'm not I'm not competitive enough. And so I started taking acting classes. I went to HB Studios uh, with Ogden. I uh, got into a, a, an advanced acting class with Stella Adler and working with her was awesome. I got into American Academy of Dramatic Arts and I worked with the, the people who worked with the Meisner Technique. I went to uh, the actor studio where Lee Strasberg was teaching and um, I, I, I hated it. Um, <laughs> Seriously, I lasted two months and it was all my emotional recall. And that is not my thing at all. I, I just couldn't stand it anymore. It was like group therapy. And I just left. I said, this is not for me. Um, I'm sure there's value in it for some people, but it didn't work for me. Anyway, um, I also took a directing class from a Broadway director and he loved the work I was doing. And he said, Mike, you know, you really got something here. You ought to pursue directing. And I, I said, uh, well, uh, you yeah, know, I mean, sure, I'll take more class. He goes, no, no, no. What you should do is go to grad school for directing. I said, really? Why would I do that? I'm working with you. You're a Broadway director. He goes, yeah, I, I can only take you so far because I said, what could they give me that you can't? And he said, the piece of paper. And I yeah. said, oh, the degree, you know? Yeah. He said, you'll thank me later you might not realize how much it means to you now, but later on it will. So I said, okay, I took his advice and I applied to grad schools around the country and I only wanted to go to a top five theater school. So um, I got accepted to University of Tennessee, their MFA directing program. And uh, they, they accepted me and they were going to give me a free ride. Uh, so I didn't have to pay for grad wow. school. That's amazing. And, uh, but I really wanted to go to Florida State because University of Tennessee was a brand new MFA program and they were looking for the grad students to kind of lead them in that program. And I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't sure I, I was in the position to do that kind of stuff. Anyway, about a week after I accepted UT, Florida state called me and said, we'd like to interview you for our MFA directing program. Can you come down to Tallahassee? And I said, uh, no, I can't. I don't have the money. <laughs> so the guy said, well, OK, uh, the head of the program said, OK, I'll fly up to New York to, to visit with you there. So we arranged it. He flew up to New York. We spent a whole day together traping around New York and just having a great time. And we talked about everything. And uh, I said, this is the deal. Uh, University of Tennessee just gave me a full ride scholarship to go there for free. If you guys can match it, I would love to go to Florida State. He goes, let me talk to my dean. He calls up the dean and um, he said, yeah, we can do that. So they, wow. accept, they accepted me and I got the same deal. So I didn't have to pay anything at Florida State. And they had a great program. So I did my MFA there. It was tough. I mean, very tough program. Uh, one of the toughest things I've ever done. Um, you were always in rehearsal. I was teaching. I, I taught four classes. I was working in the BFA acting program. I was directing a play every semester. Um, 
and I was trying to hold down, uh, you know, work on the outside just to have some spending money. Oh my goodness. It, it was, it was really tricky, uh, but I did it in two and a half years. Wow. So, How old were you when you went back to school? 30. 30? Okay. Yeah. Cause wow. the thing that, that they liked about me was that I had real world experience. Yeah. Because I was working in New York. Um, I was teaching, I, I was teaching acting classes at Barbizon modeling school I was doing my carpentry business. I was, you know, working off Broadway. I was working as a stage manager for Classic Stage Company, which is awesome. It's a really great stage. I was, I was actually, before I went to grad school, I helped to build what became known as Soho Rep, one of the all, really awesome off-Broadway theaters in New York City. Um, it was just a loft. And me and uh, this guy uh, and his, his girlfriend, three of us, uh, had a plan to build an off-Broadway theater. And since I had carpentry skills, uh, he laid out this plan and I helped actually build the audience and the dressing rooms and this and that. And then I went off to grad school. And a year later, when I came back to visit, it had become Soho Rep. And I said, man, that is wow. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was sort of, but after grad school, I never went back to New York. In the interim, while I was gone for those three years, the real estate market had just skyrocketed and everything increased in rental prices. Like it was ridiculous. Uh, and so I, I couldn't afford to go back and, and um, I had uh, gotten married too. And so uh, Ellie and I uh, had a child, my daughter, Danielle, and we were looking around saying, okay, well, where do we go? And uh, I got a job at uh artistic director of York Little Theater in York, Pennsylvania. So that started me on that path of being artistic director. Oh, wow. Okay. How did you meet? Yeah. How did you meet Ellie? When did we you meet working, Ellie? Uh, this was after I graduated from Plattsburgh, which is my undergrad school. I was down in New York City and I was, um, I wanted to get my own apartment. Um, not that I didn't enjoy living with this guy, but I want to <laughs> my, own, my own freedom. Anyway, in order to get my own apartment, I, I, I had, okay, I'll back up a little bit. I had taken a whole bunch of money that I made from a, a big job I had done, and I decided to hitchhike cross country to visit my relatives in California. So I literally just got all this money together, clothes on my back, a knapsack, and I went to an agency that had these drive-away cars where people from another part of the country need a car driven to their home or whatever. They, they purchased the car in New York and they need a driver to drive it out to them. It was, an, it, was, it was a police car auction. And so the car that I was driving looked like a police car. The, speed, the speedometer was broken. So I had no, oh, no. Idea. And I, I must have been going 90 miles an hour. <laughs> Nobody stopped me. <laughs> of course they didn't. <laughs> it's amazing. Like he's, he's chasing somebody. <laughs> so the the uh, the car had to be dropped off in Minneapolis, which is like halfway across the country. So so on the way from New York to Minneapolis, I pick up two hitchhikers, and <laughs> and so they helped me drive. We did it in twenty four hours flat. We didn't stop. Oh my god. We oh my stopped, gosh. Literally stopped for gas and kept going. And so the three of us managed to drive it all the way for 24 hours straight. I got to Minneapolis and they had given me three days with the car. So I had two days of driving in Minneapolis and I knew a couple of people in Minneapolis. So I, <laughs> I hung out there. I wound up working on a, um, a commune. Uh, they were uh, growing carrots and making carrot juice to sell. So I wound up <laughs> doing that for two days. <laughs> Sorry, Mike, I had to stop you and ask, have you ever done any writing? Because I mean, some of your experiences that you're sharing right here alone, are the, there's some great fodder in there for, 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 a, some, book. for, some, for a book, some screenplays, well, some well, whatever. Let, let, let me tell you what else I have. So I know we're going. Oh gosh, yeah, there's more. <laughs> but so I, I, so I, dropped, I dropped the car off in Minneapolis and I still have to get out to California. So I go on to... Uh, 
one of the people working at the commune said, oh, you have, to, you have to go to the U of M. They have a big call board. It's a ride board where they have rides, people needing rides and stuff. So I go there. And sure enough, there's a guy who's going out to California who needs another driver. So I look him up and we hook up and, and uh, he's uh, going to uh, he's in the Marines and he has to go out to his base in San Diego. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go with you. So we head out and he's got this beautiful uh, 396 Chevelle uh, four speed uh, stick convertible, just an awesome muscle car. And we take off and um, I'm, uh, I take off, uh, I take over driving when we get into Utah. And so we're up in the mountains, like way the hell up in the mountains. And it's midnight and um, full moon and it's just beautiful. And we're up at some high elevation and we run out of gas. Uh -oh. <laughs> literally the motor just stops. And I'm thinking, yeah, I've driven through yeah. Utah. You're literally in the middle of nowhere, I bet, right. too. So yeah. I throw the car into neutral. <laughs> I wake him up because he's sleeping in the passenger seat. I said, hey, uh, we're out of gas. He goes, oh, okay, well, let's see how far we can go. We literally coasted all the way down the mountain. It must have taken a half hour. <gasps> no, oh it, was, it was silent. It was the most awesome ride. <laughs> and, <laughs> And at the bottom of the mountain is a gas station. I pulled right into the pump oh and God. filled it up and we kept going. Oh, my That's gosh. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> what? Those are the kind of things that make me think, you know, maybe there is something weird and kooky and spiritual going on. That something's looking out for us at times. It was completely like magic. I'll, I'll never forget that. It was just a awesome. I get to California. I get to California and I'm looking up my relatives and, you know, I, I don't know California at all. And you need a car in California and it's just all highways. And so I decided I'm going to hitch, you know, I'm on the L.A. freeway hitching because I got their address. I'm trying to figure out how to get there. A cop stops me, gives me a ticket for hitching. Oh, damn it. OK, whatever. So I, I, I take the ticket, stuff it in my wallet and he goes off and I, I decide I got to keep hitching. Right. So. What does he do? He goes up the next exit, comes behind me and sees me again. Same damn cop gives me another ticket. So, no, oh, come on. <laughs> anyway, I eventually get to my relatives and we have a great time. And then I, I wanted to go up to uh, San Francisco because I had an old college buddy up there that I was going to visit. So I hitch a ride with this truck driver who's <laughs> who's. Uh, carrying 10,000 cases of dog food. He goes, I'll give you a ride if you help me unload my truck. Okay, fine. So I help him unload his truck. I climb in and uh, I'm beat. So he goes, oh, you could go up into the into the sleeper, into in the cab. And I go in there and it's like a freaking bedroom. I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> I've never seen anything <laughs> like that. So I go to sleep. He takes me up to San Francisco. I get out. And uh, I finally make it to my friend's house and he's got to go to work the next day. But he says, uh, you know, if you want to tool around town, I'll, you can use my bike. I said, great. So I take his bike and I was going up to UC Berkeley. So I, I get, I'm on the bike and I'm going up to wherever the heck Berkeley is. And I hear sirens behind me and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, something's happening. Maybe it's a robbery or something. So I pull, pull over to the side of the road to let the cops go by me. And one cop pulls in front of me and one cop pulls behind me. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what did I do? And cop gets out of the car, goes, get off the bike. I said, what's going on? He said, you just ran a red light. I said, well, there was no no traffic. I mean, I looked both ways. There was nothing. So I went through the light. He goes, well, that's against the law. You can't do that. Oh, said, no. Well, can I just speak? And then I, I, was, I was a little bit, I, 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 a little stupid myself. I said, what kind of a stupid law is that? I mean, <laughs> I'm from New York. We don't have those kinds of stupid laws in New York. He goes, well, you're in California, son. And that's the law. And I'm, uh, you know, so he, he says, okay, what's, what's your name and address? And and so I said, uh, well, and I opened up my wallet and I have like four different IDs. So I showed them all four. I said, pick one. 
And he told, oh, oh, wise guy, huh? And then he saw, he saw the yellow stubs of the tickets in my wallet, and he pulls them out. He writes them out, and he says, oh, troublemaker, huh? So he, he writes me up another ticket. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> and he goes, you have to appear before the judge on this, this such and such a date, right? So I said, oh, okay, thank you, whatever, friend. I, I go off, right? So I finally get back to New York. In the mail comes this thing from California State Patrol, and it's a warrant for my arrest. <laughs> didn't appear <laughs> you, did, you failed to appear for running a red light on your bike were you arrested <laughs> No, well, I, I I was thinking, look, let him come and find me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the lamb. <laughs> oh, boy. So anyway, I started. So Ellie and I started our journey eventually. Uh, and I said to Ellie when I married her, I said, listen, uh, I hope you like traveling because I have no idea where we're going to wind up. And she was game. You know, so, so we uh, – we wound up uh, doing a lot of traveling. I mean, we did York, Pennsylvania, which was actually pretty cool because the uh, the the Penn State campus had a, a teacher on sabbatical. They needed someone to replace them. So I got a call because I was running a theater company and they thought, well, he must know theater. And so I got a call to to uh, to, to fill in for this teacher. And um uh, that was my first real teaching job outside of Florida State because I was teaching in Florida State too, so I kind of knew the drill. But I really enjoyed it, and the the dean at at your at, um, at Penn State really liked my work, so he wrote me a great letter of recommendation, which I used for other teaching work. Um, and I hadn't considered teaching as a way to make money because for me it was all about directing. Because at Florida State we only had four people in the directing program; it was highly competitive. There were 300 applicants and only the, they only took four. Wow. And the, the four of us all thought, well, we're going to be, you know, directing in regional theaters and be really highly paid professionals. <laughs> yeah. You thought med school was going to be competitive. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is that you take the work wherever you can get it. Um, and so it was it was hard to piece enough together to make a living. You know, being artistic director allowed us to have a steady income. Uh, but the, the teaching work was really uh, what kind of moved us along. So I, we moved to South Florida. Uh, and I was telling you, Lisa, that I, I was a, a director of a touring company out of Fort Myers. And so we did dinner theater for all of the resorts, Sanibel Island, Captiva, Naples, all over South Florida. And I worked with a couple of theater companies. In fact, the Florida Studio Theater was just starting when I was there. And uh, I was working with those people. I was working with, at the time, it was called Edison Community College. And now it's called Southwest Florida, blah, blah, whatever, something or other. But at the time, it was a community college. I directed a few shows there. Um, and I, uh, I was doing uh, side jobs with a sign painter. And I was delivering Domino's Pizza. You know, just cobbling together enough work to keep us going. Um, and one of the actors I directed got a job with Charlotte Shakespeare. Uh, he was playing Macbeth. And he calls me up and he goes, Mike, you got to come up to Charlotte to see me in Macbeth. And I talked you up uh, here and the people in Charlotte really want to meet you. I think you do really well here. So I said to Ellie, I'm going to drive up to Charlotte to see so-and-so in Macbeth. I'll let you know what it's like. So I drive up to Charlotte, I see him, and he had uh, organized a meeting with all of the theater people in Charlotte to meet me. And uh, we just got along really well. And I said, wow, this might be a cool place to be. So I go back down to Fort Myers. And I said, Ellie, you want to move to Charlotte? She goes, sure, why not? So we packed everything up and moved to Charlotte. Oh, and, my goodness. <laughs> and, and so while we were in Charlotte, I got a job working with Charlotte Rep, which is the only equity company in Charlotte. And uh, I became their production manager. I was working with their new play development uh, team. Uh, I wound up directing a couple of plays for them. 
And I wound up teaching at uh, Winthrop University, which is just over the border in Rock Hill, South Carolina. So I was I was doing some teaching there. And uh, while I was there at, at uh, in Charlotte, uh, I got a call from a community theater just outside of Charlotte to guest direct a show, uh, Steel Magnolias. So I did that, and they really liked the job I did. So um, they sort of kept me on the back burner if there were any other jobs that came up. Meanwhile, I saw an ad for Actors Theater of Louisville, and they were looking for a director of their apprentice program. So I applied. They called me up. They did a phone interview. They said, we're very interested in you. And we're, we're going to hire you over the phone. I didn't even go to Louisville. They hired me right over the phone. Wow. So I said to Ellie, so uh, we're going to lo- move to Louisville. So we <laughs> <laughs> there. How old was Danielle at this point? She was about seven, I say, or eight, seven or eight. Okay. She was like in second or third grade. Anyway, we moved to Louisville. And it was a really intense job. Actors Theater is like one of the top five theaters in the country. John Jory was the artistic director. He was a legend. And they had the Humana Festival. They brought in the, 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 the A-list actors to do shows there. And I got to meet a lot of them and uh, work with some of them. They brought in the Moscow Art Theater from Moscow to work there. I got to actually work with their actors. I brought them into my acting classes to work with my students. It was incredible. The opportunities there were phenomenal. Um, I directed Midsummer Night's Dream there. Um, I uh, And some of my students actually became very well-known actors out there on the, when, once they got out of the uh, doing actors' theater work. So it was a cool experience, but very stressful. And while I was there, the theater in North Carolina that I directed Steel Magnolias from said, we're looking for a new artistic director. Are you interested? And I thought, hmm, I really like the idea of running a theater company. And so I said to Ellie, uh, how do you feel about moving back to Charlotte? <laughs> and, so, and so we did. Uh, it was just outside of Charlotte. A, a town called Concord. It's where the uh, the Charlotte Motor Speedway is. We, we lived like five minutes from there. Mike, yeah. can I ask you real quick? When did Ellie start working on sets with you? This in this part right here when okay. we moved back, and I became the artistic director of this particular theater company. I got her involved in design. I was doing Frankenstein. And it was like one of her favorite things to do. She goes, oh, I love that story. I I would love to design the set. I said, okay, do it. So she and we were working in an an old church. And the church had been, it was a Baptist church that had been bought by this theater company. And it was being sort of like renovated into a theater, which I did a lot of the work in. I was instrumental in hanging up a lighting grid, getting a sound system, I ripped out all of the pews and put in movie theater seats. I found a movie theater going out of business and we got all the movie theater seats and cleaned them. And I I helped install. Oh, my gosh. I mean, it was a lot of work, but I made that into a working theater. I was really proud of it. And one of the one of the guys that I worked with, uh, he was a high school student. He just showed up one day and he said, hey, what's going on here? I said, "Uh, I'm building a set for I I forgot what play I said. uh, do you know anything about set construction? He said, a little bit. I said, can you handle a screw gun? He goes, yeah. All right, come over here and help me. So he helped me. And I said, what, what are you interested in? He goes, well, I'd like to learn about lights. So I showed him some stuff. And uh, he wound up designing lights for my production. And he's a real sharp kid. Anyway, he wound up going to SUNY Purchase for lighting design. And his teacher, his teacher was Jules Fisher, who was one of the preeminent lighting designers on Broadway. He liked this kid, Greg, uh, so much that he took him with him to Broadway. And so Greg started, Greg started designing lights on Broadway, started doing sound. And uh, he wound up being like the personal sound person for Cindy Lauper and uh, 
a, a whole lot of other people on Broadway. Like his his work was so awesome that they wanted only him to do sound for them. Anyway, he eventually got into video. So he is now the video projection guy in Broadway. Like if you're going to do video stuff on Broadway shows, you call Greg. He did all the he, I don't know if you know um, Dear Evan Hansen, but Greg did all the video work on Dear Evan Hansen. Oh, my and if gosh. You, if you saw Dear Evan Hansen, you know how intense that was. That's all Greg's work. Like, he sits That's back. Incredible. Playing, he was telling me he sits backstage for every performance, monitoring all of the computers to make sure that all the video stuff goes as, as it's supposed to go. And uh, he, he gets paid a lot of money to do that kind of stuff. So... But I, I sort of, you know, I, I said, well, I gave him his start. You know, I gave him. You did. <laughs> can you handle a screw gun? Yeah. Can you handle a screw gun? <laughs> amazing journey. To Broadway. Amazing journey. That's an amazing so cool. Guy. But I also met another one of my really good friends, uh, Alex Malden. He walks into the theater and he says, uh, hey, I, I, I have a, a, a band and uh, we need some lights for a, a concert we're doing. Can I borrow a couple of lights? So I said, uh, sure, why not? You know, so I said, what kind of music do you play? He goes, well, it's, you know, I, I play the synthesizer, our keyboards and stuff. I said, do you, have you ever composed music? He goes, sure. And he says, I, you know, I just recently graduated from Berkeley School of Music in Boston. So, you know, well, that's one of the best in the country. So I said, well, I, I, I'd be interested in, in having you uh, compose an original score for Frankenstein. So he goes, damn, that sounds awesome. So he does. So I got Ellie designing sets. I got this guy, Greg, who I just met designing lights. I got Alex writing a, a, an original score. It was oh freaking God. awesome. It was That's awesome. amazing. I think Alec, didn't he come and um, score something else to Inhibbing? He did. He did Frankenstein. Okay. He came back and redid Frankenstein for me. And then he did Romeo and Juliet. He wrote an original score for that. Yes. Oh, awesome. That's why I, that's, yes, I knew I had met him. Yeah. So, so these are like, you know, lifelong friends. Um, in fact, when I moved to Minnesota, I got a job directing uh, The Lion in Winter. The first two people I called up, I said, Greg, can you come here to design my lights? And he goes, I'm working on um, Cabaret on Broadway. Uh, I have to, I have to ask the producer if he'll let me go for a few days. So he's actually in the middle of production. His producer said, I can give you two days. So Greg flies out to Minneapolis to hang my lights and program everything. Alex, meanwhile, drives, he drives from Charlotte up to Minneapolis, composes an, a whole original score for me and plays it live every night while, while the show's going on. <laughs> So, oh my I mean, God. These, these are the kind of friends that are just worth their weight in gold, you know? Yes. <laughs> oh, my so goodness. Cool. You also met some other really cool people that um, I remember you calling up. Like, um, you knew some uh, actual uh, stage fighting chore choreographers oh God, and stuff, too? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I met Mike during uh, the Lion in Winter production. So, it's my first production in Minneapolis. And... I needed a fight choreographer because I was I merged the film script with the stage script. There's, I do that a lot. I, I take a look at the different scripts of the plays or whatever the work is, and I knew that the I watched the film version of Light and Winter. I loved it. I said, and I looked at the stage version. I said, "Hmm, I'd like to put some of the film stuff onto the stage." And in order to do that, I have to have a good uh, sword fighting guy. So the producer calls up this guy, Mike Anderson, and Mike comes in and this guy is he's got long hair. He's got tattoos. He comes in on a big Harley. I mean, he's just this biker dude. <laughs> nice. and, <laughs> and I look at him and I'm thinking, wow, okay. This is, I, but obviously he knew his stuff and he, he choreographed some real kick-ass fights and we became really good friends. So anytime I needed fight choreography, I'd call Mike. So when I got the job up in Hibbing, I said, Mike, I got a job for you. Can you come up to Hibbing and do this? And so he was, he was, he was always up there. He'd just, you know, get on his bike and just, whew, up to Hibbing. It was a three hour drive. And uh, 
And and we would just have the greatest time. And he's probably done maybe a dozen of my shows because I, I, I do shows with a lot of fighting in them and people, people dying left and right. And so <laughs> like literally for Frankenstein, we the, the stage was literally strewn with dead bodies at the end of it. And and I, I don't know if you saw that production, Lisa, but, but I, I didn't. It was before I got up there for the curtain call. I had all of the dead bodies rise for the for the curtain call and then go back <laughs> and, and, and be dead again. You Brilliant. almost made Joan spit her tea. <laughs> that is that's fantastic. <laughs> if you have a picture of that anywhere, please share it with us. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I do somewhere. <laughs> I'd love amazing. to see that. <laughs> so yeah, so I. I I got the job in Hibbing. Uh, I just answered an ad in a newspaper. We were down here in, in, in Minneapolis and we moved uh, from Charlotte. And, and one of the reasons we moved from Charlotte was that I was on a three year contract with this theater company and my contract was up. And Ellie and I did not like living in the South. We were New Yorkers. So, you know, a Yankee from New York, you already had two strikes against you. I, as soon as I opened my mouth and I spoke with a New York accent, People, I, yeah, people didn't like me. And not only that, but I was a very progressive minded person. And I remember Danielle was forced to march in a parade that celebrated the uh, the Confederacy. Oh, like, they, they had this with the rebel flag and the whole thing. I'm going, oh. what? Are we reliving Ooh. the Civil War? Like, are you kidding me? Anyway. Oh. Yep. The thing that really turned turned the whole thing for me was uh, I was in the middle of rehearsals for a children's production, and I get a call from a parent saying that there's been uh, racial tension. What had happened was a, uh, uh, a couple of kids from the local football team, the high school football team, had gone out after a game and to the local Waffle House. Um, uh, the, the black black students, and there was a, some kind of an argument over the bill or something like that, and cops were called in, and the two white cops, and there was a tussle, and they wound up um, macing this kid, putting him in handcuffs and throwing him into the back of the car, the, the police car, and taking him down to the police station. When they opened the door to get him out of the car, he was dead. Oh, God. And oh, what had happened oh, was he had, he had a really bad reaction to the mace and had choked on his own vomit. And oh, they didn't my even gosh. Bother, they didn't even bother to check on this kid in the back seat. And um, so there was a lot of racial tension. There was going to be riots. And uh, it was – and the thing about Charlotte is that – it's literally who lives on what side of the tracks. There, there are literally railroad tracks running down this side of town where all of the black population is on one side and the white population is on the other side. And it was just eerie to see that live. Anyway, a friend, Alex, calls him. He goes, Mike, you're not going to believe this, but they're calling in the Klan. I said, what? He goes, the Klan is coming tomorrow. They're going to be at the, uh, the uh, uh. county courthouse. So I said, the hell out of there. I, I don't, I have to see this with my own eyes. So Alex and I go down to the Mecklenburg County Courthouse. And sure enough, there they are. A couple of hundred white robed clansmen with their hoods. And right in the middle is the purple dragon and some green guys off to his side. And just below them must have been a hundred state troopers. And I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, oh boy. This is not good. There's this big crowd of white people standing close to the steps. And then this sort of no man's land. And just beyond that is a big crowd of black people. And Alex and I are looking back and forth like, and I, then I, I, they started speaking and I have never heard such hatred, such filth, such disgusting speech in all my life. The most racist stuff you could ever hear. And I, 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 I could not believe I was hearing this. And I said to myself, this is not good. This is going to end really badly. And I said to Alex, I got to get out of here. I went home. I said to Ellie, we're packing up. We're getting out of here. 
We rented a U-Haul. We packed everything up and we left. We had decided we were going to move to the Twin Cities. We thought this is the best place to raise a kid and for the kind of work we wanted to do. It had a progressive a progressive environment. We had uh, the school system was good. There's a lot of theaters. I figured I could get work here. So we came to Minneapolis. We didn't know a soul. We had just enough money for five days in a motel. We had no place to live, no jobs, nothing. And within those five days, uh, we found work. We got work as a caretaker for an apartment complex. So they gave us they gave us a free apartment. We got a salary. We got a free phone, and we were right uh, up the street from from a school that Danny could go to. She could walk to it. So that worked out really well for us. Um, and so we did that for a couple of years while we sort of you know got our ourselves settled in. And in you know in the meantime, I'm looking for full time work, and I did some you know some adjunct work here and there, and I was subbing in the high schools and I was guest directing, uh, did a lot of high school plays. And then this Hibbing job came up and they called me into an interview and I'm going up there. It's three hours north of the cities in this place called the Iron Range. It's a town where Bob Dylan grew up and Bob Dylan went to high school. So that's its claim to fame. I said, well, I, I wasn't sure, but anyway, I get a call after the interview and, uh, I go up to, uh, meet with the president of the college. And uh, he looks at me and he goes, give me one reason why I should hire you. And I looked at him and I said, because you're not going to find any, anyone better for this job. And he looked at me and he said, okay, you're hired. <laughs> Can't argue with it. That's amazing. <laughs> and so that's how I got the job in Hibbing. Uh, Lisa. Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you did. Yeah. <laughs> I, I told him I'd be there for five years. I said, I can't see myself here for longer than five years, but in that five years, I'll really make this into something special. And I did. I was really proud of the work I did. But at the five-year mark, I started applying for jobs. And I got um, uh, I applied for a director of the theater uh, program at Wichita State. So they flew me down there. They interviewed me. It was a two-day interview process. And um, it was grueling. I get back to Hibbing. They call me up. They said, Mike, it's uh, you have been unanimously uh, voted to, to be our next uh, director of our theater program. They had over 200 theater majors. Like they had B BFA musical theater, BFA acting, BFA technical theater, BFA in dance. Uh, it was just incredible really big program. And so they had uh, over a hundred applicants and they picked me unanimously to be their director. So I go back to Hibbing and I tell the, the president, I said, uh, Tony, I got a, a, a job offer uh, at Wichita State. They're, they're hiring me to be their next director. And he goes, Mike, you can't leave us. I said, what do you mean I can't leave? I told you in five years I was going to leave. He goes, yeah, but you can't. You mean too much to this community. You've created something and you're the one running it. And, you know, you just mean too much to us. And you're the most visible program on campus. You know, it, it, this and that and the other thing. And um, I, I was just really waffling. And, and finally, I, I, I said, OK, I'll stay. So I called up the Wichita State people and I said, I'm going to have to unfortunately decline the offer. And they were like really disappointed because that meant that they had to go to their second choice who had already taken a job elsewhere. Uh -oh. And then, oh, no. they had, then they had to go to their third choice whom nobody liked. But they, oh, had no. to, they had to do it because of the protocols. And it wound up that this third choice that they had ruined the program. Oh, they had no. to fire oh. him. They fired him and they had to go through a whole different search and, Anyway, when we were doing the Kennedy Center stuff, I would see these people. Whenever I saw them coming towards me, I wanted to hide. And, you know, <laughs> they, because they kept all they said was, Mike, why did you turn us down? Do you know what the heck that did to us? And I felt so bad that I wasn't. But then, you know, I also looked on the other side 
of what I had done for Hibbing and the whole Iron Range because the work oh. we were doing, the work we were doing was feeding that whole area with with uh, this culture that it didn't have before. Well, yeah, and what was cool was that it was open up to the community. It wasn't just the the college students, right? And I I think that's one of the things that really helped me blossom into the into the kind of director I was meant to be, like just in terms of not only my directing work, but in of creating this vision of how a theater can serve its community and then mm, opening it beautiful. up to everybody and having every, everybody has a stake in the success of that theater. And I got really good at promoting that and getting the businesses on board and raising money and getting it visible for not just the community, but the whole Iron Range. All of Northern Minnesota knew about that theater. So that was sort of, I, I sort of developed myself there in Hibbing. So when I, when I came down to Minneapolis, when I got the job at North Hennepin, um, I had all of that experience and I started using that at North Hennepin to build that program up because they, they, they hired me basically because they knew the stuff I could do from my past experience. They saw what I did in Charlotte. They saw what I did in, in Hibbing. They saw what I did elsewhere. And uh, so I have a track record of, improving everything wherever I go. It's always, I leave it vastly improved. So that's, yeah. So that's the short version. <laughs> <laughs> and well, forget the rest of our questions. There goes the 45 yeah, minutes. <laughs> and, and so when are you releasing your memoir? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I want to read that thing. <laughs> Lisa, I, 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 st- I actually, it's funny, Joan, that you mentioned it because I just recently took a memoir writing class. Oh, and cool. And so I have my first story, Lisa. I'll email it to you, okay? Yes, please do. I definitely want to read that. (laughs) That's amazing. Oh, I can't wait. I love that. I love it so much. (laughs) Well, Mike, I mean, we've, we've, I think we could talk for hours, seriously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I bet you Joan has like a million questions as well. But um, I don't want to let the show get too long. I do um, want to talk a little bit about like maybe one of your productions. And I know we mentioned it um, when we communicated via email. Um, one of your productions that you're most proud of through the years that you have done. <sighs> wow. I was thinking about that. There's sort of my top five, I guess I would say. Uh, Right up there is Amadeus. That has got to be one of where everything came together so well. I was so proud of that, and I put my heart and soul into that. It was a labor of love. Avenue Q has to be up there as well. I had the perfect cast with the best puppets, with a great musical director, um, uh, my set design, uh, everything worked just right. I, it, it, and it's rare where everything comes together in, in, in sort of this synchronicity where it's, it, it is as it should be. And um, it's sort of like you wind it up and let it go, you know. Um, the Kentucky Cycle, which I did in Hibbing, uh, that was monumental. You know, a six-hour play, sprawling, epic, and biblical in in its content and tone. And six uh, hours, six hours. My goodness! When they did it on Broadway, they did it in two nights. You went to see part one in one night and part two the next night, or you could do a matinee in an evening. Um, I I trimmed it down to three hours, and people who had seen it on Broadway came to my production and said, you know what? I don't even know what you cut out because it seemed to be all there. So it took me a month to do that editing. And then casting it, I had 26 people in the cast playing 65 different parts. So it was just monumental in just figuring all of that out and then doing it. And then Mike Anderson was my fight choreographer and we, killed so many people it was <laughs> it was just ridiculous i mean to oh. this day i don't know how we pulled it off i remember we had to kill a, a five-year-old kid on stage Oof. by breaking his oh. neck and I, oh. I remember having and, and having a person off stage with a plastic cup and when the guy snapped his neck we crunched the cup and the people in the audience the, you could hear the gasps in the audience yeah it uh-huh. was just 
it was nerve wracking. Um, I was really proud of that show. Um, just the, it was the history of the United States, but it's the unwritten yeah. history. It's the history that we don't want to know about because yeah. it's all the bad stuff. The stuff that we just sort of sweep under the rug and make believe it didn't happen. Yeah, it's all that yeah. stuff. Oh, wow. um, really proud of that. Uh, Phantom, uh, love doing Phantom. That was hard, hard work. Um, I bet. <laughs> um, what else? Uh, Frankenstein. Oh my gosh. I've done Frankenstein three times, Lisa. Oh, have you really? I did it in wow. Charlotte. Wow. I did it in Hibbing and then I did it in North Hennepin. And I asked Ellie, she did the set design all three times and all three times it was different. And the third time when I did it in North Hennepin, she said to me, why don't we do it steampunk? So I said, oh, how cool. <laughs> and I, I got to tell you, um, I'll see if I can share that with you, Lisa. It was awesome. Ellie's set was yeah. just, I have a, I have a still photo of it. I'll send that to you. Yeah, um, yeah please it's do. It's just magical. Um, and she won an award from the Kennedy Center. Uh, oh, they, beautiful. Uh, some reps from the Kennedy Center saw the production and they just loved her set so much that they gave an award f to her for that. Yeah. She, she did amazing work. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, those are those are probably my top productions. Uh, I, I guess Avenue Q is one of those, and I, I gave you some links to look at, Lisa. I don't know if you had a chance yeah. to do that yet. Yeah, I watched a couple of them. It was pretty amazing, and I'll definitely make sure that they're linked in the description so people yeah, can check they it out. Are, yeah, they are the puppets I got from a woman who actually worked on Sesame Street. She designed the Swedish Chef puppet, and I got in touch with her, and I said. Uh, I'd like to rent your Avenue Q puppets. And she goes, I'm glad you got in touch with me because I am just redesigning and rebuilding them. She sent what? me her first iteration of the Avenue Q puppets oh, wow. that anyone had used. That's what's in the, oh, so the you, video. Yeah, you, were, you were being serious when you said you had the best puppets. Yes. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'll Absolutely. tell you something, Joan. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to find a way to make it th that way. So if I'm going to do Avenue Q, I'm going to get the best puppets. I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get the best people I can. When people came to see my production, they had seen it on Broadway and they had seen the touring production and they thought mine was as good or better. And this was a college production. Uh, we had people standing room only every single night. You couldn't buy a so ticket awesome. for it. It, it was, I, I could have run that thing for a month. People couldn't get enough of it. Um, it was probably one of the, 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 the best productions I've ever done. Uh, when we were, Lisa, when we were in Hibbing and I did Frankenstein, I did that midnight yeah. performance on Halloween night. Uh, I remember you guys talking about that. Yeah. We had, we had people lined up from the box office down the hallway out the door, down the sidewalk, and into the parking lot. That's how many people they were. They were actually scalping tickets in the parking lot. This is, <laughs> this this is <laughs> for a college production of Avenue Q. That's so well, awesome! No, no, no. This is Frankenstein. This is Frankenstein. Okay, I'm sorry. You couldn't buy a ticket to this show. The waiting list was ridiculous. They were scalping wow. tickets in the parking lot to get oh, in. It's crazy. The show. It was crazy. That's so amazing. I mean. The, these are the kinds of, you know, shows that just I'm so proud of because they really resonated with the audience. Um, they they created so much joy. And, you know, and, and my cast, these are memories that they'll never, you know, they'll never forget. Oh, yeah, definitely. Wonderful. The shows that I did with you are like such a forefront in my memory. And I mean... They literally, because I I never done anything backstage until you said, "Hey, you didn't make it into the play, but I'd like you to stage manage, and I'd like to teach you." And that was that was life changing for me. Literally, literally, you could probably say you're responsible for me meeting my significant other that I've been with for twelve years. <laughs> let me let me tell you a funny story about that. Uh, when I was doing Beauty and the Beast. Uh, the guy playing the beast and the girl playing bell met during that show and they wound up getting married. Oh, serendipitous. <laughs> and and also 
in that production, uh, one of the girls playing a napkin and a guy playing, I forgot what part he had, they met also and they got married. And I, offic- I officiated at their wedding. Oh, <laughs> right? sweet. So, so cool. Yeah. So, so cool. I mean, there's there's those kinds of cool stories that. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. But but I, I think Lisa, and that's another thing that I, I've kind of gotten good at is just sizing people up and figuring out where they can best serve the production. So I saw that with you. Um, and I, I, I've done that with a number of people where if I can't cast them, I'll say, yeah, but I see something in you that I think is going to work out better if you do that. And, you know, and I, I can teach you to do almost anything in theater. Yeah. I was pretty, yeah, that was pretty amazing to be able to learn all that stuff. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask, Mike, um, I know you mentioned that you sort of, you just sort of accidentally fell into, into theater when you were, what, 17? You were in high mm-hmm. school? Yeah. And, um, but I was wondering, I mean, growing up in New York City, you're surrounded by so much, so much, much performing arts and so much theater. Was there ever a time in your childhood when you saw any live theater and did it resonate with you at all? Or, or did it, was it just something that you kind of fell into at that slightly later time? I'll tell you, Joan, my parents were not theater goers at all. Mm, okay. That was not in our family history. So I was not exposed to theater. Wow. Um, and we moved out to Long Island and, you know, into the, a, a suburb of New York City. And so, you know, going to high school there was, I, I was not exposed to theater at all. And and my mm-hmm. parents were pretty strict about after school activities. I really didn't engage in, in much at all after school. Uh, they were pretty strict Italians. You know, you had to do this and this and this. And if you didn't, mm-hmm. there were consequences and you just never crossed. You just, you know, you towed the line kind of thing. Um, and, and, and partly because of that, I left home after high school uh, uh, and I kind of made it on my own because uh, yeah. it was so rigid and, and so kind of constrictive that I felt if I don't leave, I'm never going to be able to find who I really am. Uh, yeah. And so that's, and so be, being at the community college opened up that door for me, mm. having that high school experience sort of gave me the idea, hmm, this can be fun. But it was in college where my acting teacher really gave me sort of uh, confidence that maybe I could be good at this. But as far as any specific shows, not really. Um, There wasn't anything until I started doing it myself Yeah, and seeing how that magic worked, you know. Yeah. And in a way, to me, that makes that makes your story so much more incredible, too, because, you know, you like you said, you sort of stumbled into this experience in high school. You had fun with it. And then in college, you had a teacher actually, you know, um, give you the confidence to go forward with it. So, you know, it's it's really, really cool. I mean, the tra- trajectory of your career from beginning to now is just amazing. It's been amazing to hear that story. And, and I think, Joe, one of the things I've learned over, over the years is to always give back. Just like that teacher gave me confidence, I want to give my students the confidence to go forward as well. And so I've taught, I've literally taught thousands of students, thousands over my career. And I always try to meet them where they're at and to help them along to improve. And I set the bar pretty high. I mean, I I like to challenge my students. I like to challenge whoever I work with. You know, it's not, it's never just good enough. You can always strive to be a little bit better. I'll teach you how to get there. Just follow this, you know, and you do the work and it'll pay off. So, you know, I, I, I'm the kind of person that believes of if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and I definitely saw that um, because I'm still in contact with some people from Hibbing as well. And um, they heard I was coming on to to chat with you and they said to say hello. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes. So, um, you know, you've you've definitely made an impact. And I I think that you have done a wonderful job with your career. And I'm so glad that you stumbled into it. And you better write a book because... (laughs) (laughs) 
this is way more about you than I ever knew. <laughs> <laughs> or even was like, I was so timid, I think, in uh, at that time in my life, too, to even ask you all of that stuff. So I'm glad I got to hear some of it. <laughs> well, I guess we have to wrap up. I hate to. I know. But... <laughs> this, this has been a delight. <laughs> it's been absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Um, Mike, I do want to ask real quick, um, briefly, what would be some advice that you would give to somebody that was just starting their career in directing? Well, I, I could tell them what worked for me. I, I don't know. The, the landscape is changing. Um, one of the things that worked for me was I attached myself to a theater company whose work I really enjoyed and appreciated. And I started working for them for nothing. Um, I did box office. I did um, putting flyers around. I started building sets for them, hanging lights, whatever. Um, and I told the producer that eventually I wanted to direct. And I worked there for a year before an opportunity came up. Uh, they had This director had just cast a show when – uh, he fell very ill, had to be taken to the hospital, wound up he had pneumonia. And he was he was going to have a lengthy hospital stay. And they had just cast the show. And the producer's just going like nuts. Oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I need a director. And I said, um, right here. <laughs> and he said, uh, okay. I said, Dominic, you can trust me. I've done everything else that you've asked me to do. And I, I just trust me. I know I can do this. He said, okay, don't mess it up. <laughs> so I, I inherited, I inherited the cast. I walked into my first rehearsal. I didn't know any of these actors and I had to really ingratiate myself right away. I did my homework. I, I knew the play and it, 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 it well, I got it together. Anyway, the production went off really well got a great review in the local newspaper. Some producers from other theater companies had come to see it and they approached me afterwards and said, would I direct for them? And so that's what started me on this path is that one thing led to another, to another, to another. Um, but it was attaching myself to this theater company that allowed me to see the inner workings of how a company works and how directors work. Cause I would sit in on rehearsals and whatnot. Um, and it gave me the confidence that, hey, I could do this. When I went to grad school, I learned a whole lot more, but I already had a pretty good basis in, in just knowing how it, it could work. Um, now, in this particular climate where there is, uh, there's is there been a, 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 a racial reckoning and there's been a lot more representation for minority theater creators, and it's long overdue. What I'm finding is, as I'm going out uh, interviewing for guest directing work, is that being an older white guy is a little difficult right now because most of the jobs are going to women or women of color or LGBTQ uh, people, and they need to get that work because they've been denied that work for so long. So I'm finding that for a person like myself, I'm going to have to just take a backseat for a while and see where the chips are going to fall. And there may be a job here and there that that uh, people feel I'm, I'm qualified to do or that I'm a good fit for. Um, so that, you know, as far as advice goes, learn the craft, um, but be the kind of person you want to work with. That to me is really mm. important because there's a lot of jerks out there. There are a lot of directors who know what they're doing and who are really good at it but they're royal pains in the asses to work with. They're just mm -hmm. not really nice people. And yeah. they they belittle actors. Uh, they mm -hmm. just think that they know everything and they come off as very arrogant or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I don't work with those people. I fired like, those kinds of people from, from, yeah. uh, from my production team. I don't need that. Uh, life is too short to have to deal with that crap. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but if you're going to get into this business – be the kind of person you want to work with. I, yeah. I love that line so much. Be the kind of person you want to work with. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, I thank you. Just appreciate it so much. And 
Yeah. I could I could sit here and, and talk to you for another I just met you and I could sit here and talk to you for another like three hours. I, swear. <laughs> I mean that. Well, oh. well we, we you know, you can do this again at another time after enough time has lapsed and we can just sort of maybe yeah. hone in on something specific. Yes, that'd be wonderful. I'm just rambling here. <laughs> no, no, it was great. It was wonderful. <laughs> and we'll go ahead and link um, to some of uh, Mike's YouTube channels and different things that are out there so that you can see some of the productions that he has done. We look forward to seeing what other things you have in the future, even though you're officially retired. I don't see that actually stopping. I'm sure you'll find some positions that'll take you. So, Yeah. You know, once you start doing this, it's hard to just leave it all behind. And that's a crazy thing about, you know, saying I'm retired. I still find myself drawn towards, I have to direct at least one or two shows a year. It's just in your blood. And I also have to teach. I find that my brain is kind of wired into sharing my knowledge with students and trying to make them better citizens and better human beings. And that's sort of a mission that I've set for myself. And it's like, like I said before, like giving back. I've been very fortunate to have some of my teachers give me their knowledge and experience, and I need to share what I've learned from them with the students that I have now. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us here on Performance Anxiety, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode.